the title of today is GameStop, the biggest you in financial history even with Ben Mesrich. Today, we're talking about events that everyone will have heard about earlier in 2021, the GameStop saga. Martin, you're a financial man. What's What happened here? So how do I paraphrase? So in, in the most basic terms, thousands of people in various you know, online communities on Reddit in particular began pumping money uh, into shares of, 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 of GameStop. This was after they got wind of a number of hedge funds betting against the company. So we'll get into a short selling in a minute, right? But the share price began to skyrocket, right? Boom, 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 right? They're buying, they're buying, right? The supply and demand, the price is going up. That's all good. So a lot of trading companies lost a lot of money and a lot of trolls got very rich quickly. So you think. Okay. Can you break that down for us laymans, please? Well, so a stock rises based upon supply and demand in terms of pricing, right? And, and it based on, based on market cap. Mm -hmm. So if more people are buying, right, and, there, and and there's only a certain amount of availability of stock, it's pushing the price up. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a, a, a spread. So this is how uh, share prices rise. So if people are buying a lot of stock and they're pushing the price up, they're pumping it up. But short selling is different. Short selling is saying, well, I think the price is too high, so I'll sell against it, so I'll trade out. Right? So hence short, I'll go short on my, 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 my position. And then when the stock's lower, they'll buy back. So Got the you. problem with short cycles and short sellers will be around forever, right? But they're generally not healthy, right? Because yes, it can it can help with correcting a stock, but consistent short selling, hence Musk hates it, right? Because volatile stocks attract a lot of short sellers. They're like they're like friendly piranhas, mm. right? They're, 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 that's how I view view short selling. But the problem with with the uninitiated that were pushing the price up, betting against the, the hedge funds, is as it was correcting, they were pushing, pushing, pushing. But where could it go? Because mm -hmm. there was no consistent confidence. And to get their money out, what do you think they did? Well, they sold it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So becoming a short seller, boom, you, cra you crashed the, the price. So the hedge the funds stock. were doing that to GameStop. We're shorting well, GameStop. Well, uh, no, they decided because the stock was trash. I mean, the problem was if you look at GameStop and its business model, right, it was trash. And so ultimately it was in trouble. But so they decided to bet against it. And also, as I understand it, there's a bunch of derivatives in there. So I won't get into it, but if they, if they were to create put options into this, they, would have, they could have extended their exposure. I don't know. I didn't look it's at it in any detail. Now. But the hedge yeah. funds lost against Twitter yeah, but I would and Reddit. Argue, yeah, but I would yeah. argue, and I'd be interested in what Ben said here, is that um, you don't get to keep pushing the price up. Hence, the idea is go long and hold, hold on to the stock. So eventually, everyone becomes a short seller if they're trying to get short-term gain. So not everyone would have got rich unless they'd become a short seller at a certain point on that rising curve so essentially this was a populist movement on social media to stick the fingers up at hedge funds good work guys so we've got mr ben mesrich who's the author of many books most notably i love this book by the way i love the film too the accidental billionaires which was famously adapted for the oscar winning the social network his latest called the anti-social network draws on hundreds of hours of interviews with people who lost one and orchestrated everything we've just talked about the golden rule of wall street he says is that wall street always wins but this time they did not the rules are there to be broken and they were that day. So sometimes you just need to change the game. Ben Mesrich, welcome to the podcast, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited. This feels like an epic saga that unfolded where you just rubbing your hands with glee saying, this is my next book. Yes. I mean, you know, or did you even see it? Yeah. <laughs> did you care? <laughs> I, I was I was watching it all happen because I've always kind of been a stock you know, day trader kind of guy and I've dabbled mm -hmm. in penny stock so i knew oh, that you're that guy we hear about people like that yeah the GameStop thing must it be was, minted. i was watching it happen and then i started getting all these calls people saying you should write about this it's up your alley and so i dove in and um it was just this kind of fast-paced crazy moment where a, a bunch of angry angry people stuck at home in the middle of a pandemic took on <laughs> wall street and and won for a short period of time and maybe one in the long term and we'll still see but it's a crazy story. I mean, billions and billions of dollars changing hands in, in two days. And Wall Street got hit hard. This one firm lost, you know, half its value uh, to a bunch of people sitting on their couches. So it's it's a really cool story, I think. Um, but yeah, I dove right in. Did you, did you invest yourself? Um, so I did not buy any GameStop during this. It happened so quick. Um, but I love GameStop. You know, listen. It's a ridiculous company. It's a company that probably should have disappeared just like Blockbuster and every other mall based. <laughs> right, right, I mean, right. they sell video games and toys in a mall during a pandemic. But I loved it. Nostalgically, I love it. I have two little kids who, who are happiest in a GameStop store. Um, so I understood the feeling that this evil Wall Street, you know, all of these companies were taking on 
this this thing that a lot of people loved um, and betting against yeah. it. Mm. One of the the feelings is is when you're betting a company is going to do well. We all understand that. That's great, and you make money if they make money. But when you bet that a company is going to fail, there's this mm. ethical, moral feeling that that's wrong. For sure, right? Yeah, um, totally. So so even though it makes sense yeah, from an economic point of view. There's something that feels wrong about betting that GameStop's going to go out of business. But, but, but you know, Ben, one of the things I didn't like, I was at JP Morgan for, for nine years and, you know, did a whole range of different things. But one thing I realized is that just like the business has no face, right? It's a pseudo face, right? I mean, it's represented by a many, a collection of people and it doesn't sleep. And just like the financial markets, uh, there's a, a no, there's no conscience to the financial markets there is a regulator that says please sail in this direction mm. but there is no conscience they don't care. so in other words we can create instruments that will bet against companies but this is what happens right people aren't necessarily loyal they're loyal to a dollar or a pound note but they're not loyal to a company if elon musk gets another supply backlog or never launches the cyber truck and doesn't come up with another upgrade all of a sudden the short sellers will come out and you know he'll lose 100 million off his company uh, or more it's just there's no conscience. And maybe there's loyalty with Apple because confidence and Amazon has been consistently high because they've always consistently grown, you know. And, and so you can, you know, that's how the market was built. But um, it's always surprised me that, that uh, with, there's all of these people that really don't care. <laughs> maybe they don't need to care. That's more of a. But their jobs are not are on the line to care. They don't, maybe don't need to care about that's a brand. What I'm I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's definitely, you know, this story in itself sort of put that into a different framework, I think, because people fell in love with this stock, right? And so even when the value of it didn't make sense or there's no fundamentals, that's the whole idea behind the meme stock. Mm. It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, If enough people like it, it's going to go up. And that was what drove this more than the faceless, like on the Wall Street side, they couldn't give a crap what they were buying and selling. I mean, it's just, a you know, it's meaningless to them. You're right. It's faceless and everything. But for the people who were on the other side, I think for a brief moment, there was love involved. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm married in the US. And I live between both countries. And I have to tell you that I miss the GameStop next to my Panera bread. Oh, me and too. I would go I would go and get my coffee and, and my cinnamon roll, walk over and I'd be with one of my kids and we'd go and buy an Xbox game. Exactly. I went to Panera and GameStop yesterday. See what I mean? Yeah. It's a, you, two, you two are the Redditors and the Twitter people behind this. That's I, really what happened. I, I tell you what we are is, right? We, yeah. we, are, we are Americans that are, or American people that go into a mall and they expect to see staples. Not staples I still store, feel but, like that. Although staples yeah. is it, but, but staples of life. Like to me... The tragedy was that everything went into the cloud, and even though it takes forever to download Call of Duty, and it's mm. go put it back in a you know in, in a in a but in a disc, right? And so that we can actually go back to GameStop. No brand is safe though. If you do, if you don't make the transition in this digital world, you saw it over here with Topshop. Yeah, they didn't make the transition into online retail, and then they're done. Yeah, you yeah. know those. Yeah. I miss the high street or the mall. Just and I've ventured into many GameStops. Yeah, no, it's just no, one you, of those places. No, you haven't. I have. All right, not as right. much as you. And you guys are meeting up on a Saturday, <laughs> but I, like, you know, I, I was sad. I mean, so do you think, you know, you're clearly the best person to chronicle this whole thing, as you were famed for dramatic personal stories behind major drivers in pop culture. Obviously, most famous one being Social Network very glitzy and a story of betrayal and uh, <laughs> genius, right. right? But the uh, here you've told the GameStop story, which has a deep access to everyone was involved, people behind the Reddit board, social media users, you followed leads, you've, some of the hedge fund managers who lost out big time, you know, were those interviews emotional? Were they hard to, were they keen to talk? Yeah. You know, give us a picture about all of what went into writing this sure. thing. And I mean, the those characters people. involved in this are pretty, pretty eclectic and, and in some ways absurd. The hedge fund people were not thrilled, you know, that I was writing this story because it doesn't necessarily paint them in the best light. I mean, they basically lost to something they didn't understand what was going on. And it was no fault of their own. I mean, shorting GameStop made perfect sense. Um, you know, that company should not be worth a ton of money. And so from their point of view, it was the simplest trade they ever did. They shorted GameStop. Um, but when this board of sort of trolls in a way decided to go after them and not just GameStop, but went after every stock, this one company, Melvin Capital, had shorted, it was very personal. And so some of those guys did not want to talk to me. And then there's the Robin Hood angle. Um, so I had to get inside Robin Hood, the company, the whole idea of this app 
that gamifies Wall Street. Wall Street becomes one big video game. Wow. I don't know if you guys have used Robinhood or similar. What is this oh, app? Yeah. yeah, it's on your phone and it almost looks like a video game. You can buy and sell stocks. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have any, there's no balance level that you need to have. There are no fees. You can open an account and by that afternoon, like be buying and selling and confetti comes up Man. when you buy a stock. It, it And it's fun, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it is yeah, fun. Yeah. every college kid, every every 20 year old, that's how you buy stock. You do it on this little app called Robinhood. And from their point of view, they mm -hmm. were giving Wall Street tools to everyone, democratizing finance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the reality is it just made it fun and easy and a casino. Um, and so that's another mm -hmm. part of the story. I had to get inside that. And then there's the regular, you know, the people on Reddit. And, and most of them really wanted to talk to me. So that was pretty easy and fun. And it was just finding the right people um, that, that I had a college kid who made a fortune. He made a quarter million dollars. On a, on a few thousand dollar investment, just getting in and out. And then I wow. interviewed a woman, a single mother of two, who just wanted to make enough money to buy her kids braces. Um, but she's an interesting oh character. God. You know, um, she's someone who's been screwed over by life over and over again and then supported Trump because she was so angry at the world and, and, and sure. wanted to make some money on GameStop. And so it's such a, a variety of people. But yeah, getting inside the Wall Street side is always tricky because they're very scared and, and lawyered up and stuff and so it's part of the game i mean listen zuckerberg was was probably as hard as it's gonna get so if i could handle facebook and zuckerberg i think i can handle Wall Street. It, it, interestingly enough that person that, that put a couple of grand in and got 250 grand back he must have been lit or he or she must have been right there in the four or five hours of of trading um because i think it peaked at, at 36x right so i mean he took most of that yeah i mean the story goes you know the stock started in a few dollars a share and this guy named Keith Gill, mm. just this regular guy in, in Massachusetts, put fifty three thousand dollars into it and started going on all these boards and talking about it. That's not a reg Reddit. regular guy. Fifty three thousand well, pounds was, you know, or dollars. So yes, he put all his money in, though. I mean, the guy basically fair play put every bet, everything he had on this YOLO. That's the whole idea of YOLO. You know, he basically said, I'm just going to put yeah, all yeah. my money into this one stock and talk about it. And and um, and then all these people started getting into it and this sh company had shorted it, you know, so yeah. it was so shorted that 140 percent of shares. So more shares than exist were on the short side, yeah. which means there was crazy. incredible moment where people started to buy it. It created a squeeze and it just went crazy. And so regular people bought in like this kid bought in at like twenty dollars a share. And when everything went crazy in that four day period, it ran to five hundred dollars a share pre-market. Wow. Um, so, you, you know, the hard part is getting out, right? It's easy to get into a stock. It's very oh, yeah. hard to get out, especially when you've made money. Um, people want to hold for that, like, next thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the principle of how Vegas makes all its money. No one ever walks away winning mm -hmm. double their money, right? Everyone, sure. they double their money and then they want to make 10 times their money. Um, yes. And, then, and, then, and they do anything they can to keep you in the casino, oh, yeah. right? They're very smart. Uh, and yeah. similarly, Robinhood and Wall Street, there's this pressure to stay in. And, and so in the book, I get into it, this kid was up this ridiculous amount of money and still didn't want to sell. And everyone around him wow. telling him, is he crazy? You got to get out. This is going to drop. But he believed, he loved the stock, didn't want to get out. And that's the hardest thing is walking away from the table when you have a, a win. Um, and so, you know, he did get out and he made a lot of money, but plenty of people wrote it up and wrote it back down. Um, so you know, oh, wow. part of the story as yeah. well, um, when Robinhood froze trading on the stock, it dropped. Um, so there's this whole drama behind that, which is why that happened, how that happened, whether there's a conspiracy involved and, you know, whether Wall Street really does always win in the end. Why would Robin Hood freeze that? So what happened was all of these regular people were buying the stock and it created this short squeeze situation. The, the hedge funds had mm -hmm. to get out. So they had to get basically buy back the stock, which also drove it up. The stock's going crazy. Then Elon Musk tweeted um, he tweeted game stonked to his 42 million fans um, and linked the Wall Street bets board. And so at that moment, the stock just skyrocketed. And Robinhood mm -hmm. was putting all these trades through. And it turns out they got a call. So there's something called um, clearing. So when you buy and sell a stock, the brokerage that's in between you and the trade, they have to mm -hmm. put up money to ensure that buy and they sell. And so they got a call, a collateral call, for $3.7 billion at 5 a.m. The company doesn't have $3.7 billion. So they had to sure. come up with a way 
of lowering that number. And their only choice was, they say, was to freeze trading on the stock. So all the people who were on 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 Red on on Robinhood couldn't buy any more shares. It just froze. They could still sell their shares, but they couldn't buy. And it wasn't just Robinhood. A number of firms had to do the same thing because there was so much buying pressure. The whole stock was going crazy. So when that happened, the stock just starts to drop um, because no one can buy it anymore. But Wall Street can still get out of it. And so this Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. created this massive anger. Uh, You know, basically everyone was like, we're getting screwed again. You know, Wall Street is basically Mm. able to get out of their positions, but we can't buy any more shares. And that deflated the stock. So it it went as high as close to 500 and then dropped all the way back down to 200 and never really got back up there. Can you, I think we need to sum it up in a timeline. If you could just give us the the timeline of what happened and how it developed up to to where we are. Yeah, I'm going to give you the, this is the GameStop story. Basically, in the summer of 2019, this regular guy from Brockton, Massachusetts, which is like a working class neighborhood in, in Massachusetts, was buying GameStop. The stock was at $4 a share. He put $53,000 in it. And he started going online and talking about it. He had a live stream under the name Roaring Kitty on YouTube. He called himself Deep F***ing Value on Reddit. And, and he, <laughs> this is amazing. That was him. And all these people thought he was an idiot. Everyone would post, you're a total idiot. At the same time, this hedge fund called Melvin Capital had shorted GameStop and an enormous short position. But it was a normal short position. I mean, everyone was shorting right. GameStop. 140% of the shares were short. Shorting works mm-hmm. like this. I believe a stock's going to go down. So I borrow a share of the stock now. Let's say it's trading at $10. And I promise mm-hmm. to give you back that share. When the stock goes down to $1, I buy it for $1. And I give you back the share, and I've made $9. That's what shorting mm-hmm. is. So I make money when it goes down. But if a lot of people short a stock and the stock starts to go up, we all have to get that sh- those shares back to return them, right? And that drives it even higher and creates what's called a short squeeze. So shorting is very dangerous because your losses mm-hmm. are not capped anywhere. It can just go up and up and up and up, and you can lose an infinite amount of money. Wow, yeah, for yeah. Sure. Right? So Melvin Capital is shorting this company. Because they were shorting it in a public way, that became known on the Reddit boards. And so all of these Reddit people started to say, hey, Wall Street is going to short GameStop. Let's see if we can f*** them. So all of these Reddit people basically started to buy the stock. And this regular guy from Brockton was kind of their mascot in a way. And it started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it all came to a head on four days in January of of this year, actually. And so the Mm -hmm. stock had been hovering at $4. It had run to about $20 because this guy named Ryan Cohen had joined the board. Ryan Cohen was the guy who created Chewy, was this billionaire, brilliant guy who created this, you know, it sold pet food, basically. But was was Right. So basically, all of a sudden, it was going, 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 going. And a short squeeze actually began. During these four days in January, the stock started to run. And it ran from $20 to like 70-something dollars. And that freaked out Wall Street because all these short guys then had to cover. So Melvin Capital got got out of the stock, you know. But by covering, it created this massive pressure upward. And so it went from $70 to $200. And that's when it caught the attention of Elon Musk. Now, Elon hates short sellers. Uh, Tesla was almost destroyed by short sellers. It was almost destroyed even before it started because all these people were betting against it. So he's been very publicly against it. So he tweeted mm-hmm. Game Stonk, which is kind of this ridiculous tweet. And it galvanized the entire Reddit community, which is 10 million strong at this point. And you have to remember, 10 million people with $1,000 each is as valuable as any Wall Street hedge fund. I mean, that's a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. money to put on one side of a stock. So they all bought the hell out of it. The stock ran all the way to $500. And then Robinhood got this massive collateral call and had to freeze trading on the stock. That created an uproar all over the internet. You know, everyone from every politician to every sort of pundit to the Mark Cubans of the world, everyone was screaming about, you know, the little guy is getting screwed once again. Um, The stock plummeted down a couple hundred Mm -hmm. points. And then there were all these conventional hearings. So that's kind of the drama. It's this rise and fall. It was all kind of this regular guy started it in a way. Um, this hedge fund shorting it started it. Um, and then these random people stuck at home sitting on their couches. And you have to remember there were stimulus checks. So all of these regular people suddenly had like a thousand bucks that was handed to them. Right. And they were supposed mm-hmm. to use it on food and rent. Right. But nobody wanted to use it on food and rent. 
because where's that going to get you, right? It's going to get you sure. another month sitting in your apartment. So they all said, what if we, what if this works? I can make this thousand dollars turn into a hundred thousand dollars, right? And so yeah. that's really what happened. Uh, and all these people just took this money that was supposed to be used for food and rent and bet it on GameStop. It's insanity. Yeah. And there's lots Absolutely. of, you know, I mean, weirdness to the story because um, the way Robinhood makes its money is it sells your trades through a market maker. So basically this company called Citadel, which sits at the center of the American economy, basically, and really the economy of the whole world, is this kind yeah. of giant firm. Um, and right. They ended up throwing money into the hedge fund that had lost all of the money. So it looked like oh. they were involved in, in why Robinhood froze the stock. Because so Citadel to Robin Hood is Robin Hood is just a platform and then they trade on they make the trade on your behalf through Citadel. Basically, they sell they the way they make their money is people who use Robin Hood are are not um, their their customer. Uh, it, it, it feels like you're their customer. But the reality is you're their product because they take all wow. of those trades and they sell them uh, essentially to a market maker who then uses that information to make their money. So they know where all the buying and selling is going on. That market maker also happened to be the company that threw money into the hedge fund that was shorting the stock. So it looks very ugly. And that's why there were all these, you know, congressional hearings. And was this a conspiracy? Um, um, Robin Hood says, and the reality is probably they just got a collateral call. Citadel mm -hmm. makes money on, on, you know, trading on stocks and didn't have to pressure anybody to do anything. So there probably wasn't a conspiracy to do anything like that, but it looked very ugly. And, and the people that screwed were regular people, um, as yeah. usual. But I think I'll can over, um, what's his name? Ken Griffin is the uh, CEO of uh, Citadel. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a, they have a famed position, a bit like, you know, you can look at all the other, uh, you know, great firms out there on the private equity side or on the, or, you know, on the hedge fund side. But he, um, you know, Citadel did well from this. I mean, it's, right? it's, and, you know, it's hard to know what really happened in the background there. Um, Citadel always does well. <laughs> so Citadel is one of these, right. yeah. you know, it's just this yeah. giant fund. It also is a market maker. It has all these different divisions. Um, it's worth, what, $28, 30000000000 billion at this point, something like that. Uh, I don't know exactly his personal net worth, but he's probably the most powerful person on Wall Street. And there's a lot of dark stories about him, and I get into This is wild. Um, yeah. And so... All of that stuff is kind of behind closed doors. And it's funny, there's the book has a big part. There was a big congressional hearing. So all the congresswomen and men in, in, in the United States interview basically called all these people in. To, and they didn't even know what questions to ask because it's so completely complicated and complex and opaque that these giant firms are basically running on their own. And there's almost no way to regulate them because you can't even tell what the hell it is that they're doing. And so mm. if you watch that congressional hearing, you know, on YouTube or wherever you watch it, it's so obvious that the, the con congressional people have no idea what even to ask um, because it's just so complicated and complex. And, and Ken Griffin, the head of Citadel, basically sits there saying, you guys don't have any idea what you're doing. Um, and so it's very hard to regulate when you don't even understand how it works. Um, I, I think this, this gets to a big flaw, though, right, Ben? And yeah. Uh, really, it comes back to the regulator is, is antiquated, oh, yes. right? The SEC needs to do a much better job. I mean, first of all, in understanding mutuals and, and hedge funds. And hedge funds, you know, they're pretty much a dark box, right? I mean, uh, so, so market making is different. So I'll give Citadel the idea that there is actually implied transparency. But in the hedge funds, they get away with enormous amounts of derivative complexity. Now, okay, they win and they can lose at the same time, but they can crash companies, mm. right? They, you know, they can asset strip companies faster than anyone. They can take the wheels off with their eyes shut. And it's kind of scary. And, and I think that in that, I did see the go, I saw the, uh, I love um, the hearings, by the way. They're always fun. I love the Silicon Valley ones. Mm. But when I saw this, the thing that struck me was that the SEC did such a bad job in preparing questions <laughs> for the senators mm. it was you know the, 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 the people that were asking the questions were dumb but what are they um, what are they trying to solve at that point because there's like it's almost like uh they're just doing it to run for well, no, process no. do you yeah, know what i mean well, they like, are but there's a big thing here depending i mean uh, and this is you know i want to hear from ben on this but the thing that you that they will try to protect is the big one is consumer protection right mm -hmm. so people that don't know what they're doing even if they're stupid enough to bet their money 
in America and in England, mm. we don't like that, right? We try to tell, that's why we have warnings and everything, right? We say, look, be, do, beware, this will kill you. Beware, have yeah, you? Yeah. It's a bit like when you go into the bank and they say, have you had a phone call from someone that wants you to yeah. buy this incredible thing? So the SEC has this consumer protection angle as one of their main goals. So, uh, so they're, 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 it's beholden to them, forget that people get rich, that there's not any corruption and B, how do they protect people from, from joining this ride, mm-hmm. right? Maybe it's the guy that wrote on Reddit and said, look, join me on this crusade or let's, it's a bit like crypto, let's just, you know, the, the, the financial system. But ultimately people got hurt. Mm. The company was never going to do anything because it went back to really where it was. I love mm-hmm. the company, but at the end of the day, you know, it's an outdated business model, sure. right? And it's getting eaten up by, by progress. Yep. But I think that that's what they try to get, but I don't think there was any... And it sounds you agree, Ben. There wasn't much of a conclusion. Well, yeah, right, I mean, this that is came the problem. Out. So the libertarian in me wants to say, okay, people should be able to do whatever they want with their money. But then you have a company mm-hmm. like Robinhood who's basically saying, here's a video game version aimed at 20-year-olds and college kids. Take your money and bet on whatever you want, and it'll be fun and exciting. And so you want to give the tools of Wall Street to regular people. But if you don't have the education that goes with it, people mm-hmm. are just gambling. Right. It's just like Mm -hmm. sports betting. It's It's like any other form of gambling. So the question is, should you be able to do whatever you want with your money? Um, Probably. Right. But if you don't know what you're doing and you just bet on random stocks because you saw it on Reddit and then you get killed, it's kind of bad for everybody. Um, And so a lot of this, it kind of goes back to there's so much bubbling anger. Right. A lot of this story Mm. is about anger. You know, you can go back to the 2008 and and everybody getting screwed then you can go back to occupy wall street you can go to the pandemic everyone is stuck at home meanwhile wall street is making tons and tons of money and so suddenly Mm -hmm. there's this gamestop company and this is our chance to screw wall street and so all these people dove in and that's as far as they thought it through right (laughs) they threw their money through wall street so should there be some level of of protection to people who don't really realize what these hedge funds are trying to do and how they can get out that the stock can be stopped trading. I don't think just like that bought yeah. stock knew that stocks regularly stop trading. I mean, this happens, yeah. you know, if stocks, volatile, yeah, yeah. you know, they can stop yeah. it. They can put the foot on the brakes. Yeah. And I don't think people even realize that could happen. And so I think there's, there's no education that goes along with the ability to just throw all your money in there. And then there's this other yeah, concept I, that I, I really love getting into, but on Wall Street, if you get into a position and it gets screwed, you just get out of the position, right? Maybe you lose a little right. money, but it's not your life, right? The, the, the hedge fund guys mm-hmm. are going to go to their million dollar mansions and it's fine. But a regular guy throws all his money in. If he loses that money, that's it. You know, he's kind of screwed and you don't get that money back and you don't move on to the next thing. And so it's very dangerous. It's not a fair playing field in, in any way. And so that's where the SEC and stuff like that have to kind of step in. So I think about this a lot, and I think of them as societal dangers, right? People need looking after. We don't like to hear that, but but this is why we have government. There are certain we protect people from themselves. So if they're going to use gamification as a strategy to get access to markets, or they think they hear from a friend, this is a sure bet, or bet on a horse, or whatever, they need to know that there are risks implied. When they destroy their life, they destroy other people and other economies. So on a macro level, there's a societal change that happens when people make long range, you know, poor, bad bets. The other thing is, if you've got a demand that's broken, then you encourage the fragility of supply to work. In other words, if no one's regulating and demand falls or increases momentarily, it means it encourages things like misrepresentation. So if, if there is no regulation or there is no explanation or protection, it means the citadels Blackwater, whoever you want, can go and do what the hell they want because it doesn't matter. And that worries me a lot. That, 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 that to me is a very dangerous society. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know if there was any real conclusions, but they'll be stopping that guy uh, getting on Reddit. Well, I don't know. I mean, he's kind of the hero of the story in a way because, yeah. you know, he was a regular guy, you know, in, in his basement of his house <laughs> who, who would go online and stream for eight hours a day talking about GameStop because he genuinely loved the stock. I, I don't think he was, you know, I don't think he was lying or untrue. He still holds it. I mean, that's the crazy thing. Is that that's crazy. He bought more. Um, he just believes <laughs> in this stock. And he went from $53,000 to $45 million. That's how much stock he holds. <laughs> 
That's crazy. Um, and so, you know, you got to you got to respect this guy, at least to say this guy really, truly believes in this stock. Um, and he bet the ranch. Right? Yeah, I can't believe those numbers. Yeah, um, it's actually kind of funny when you think about it. Someone who has very little is willing to take much more risk than someone who has a lot, um, because if you have ten thousand dollars in the bank, doubling your money isn't going to do much for your life. Right. So doubling your money, you don't walk away with two times your money. You need 10 times your money to make it matter. So the people with a very little ended up doing this YOLO investing, the idea of just throw your money in and I'm going to make 10 times this money or I'm going to make nothing. Sure. Um, and I'd rather lose everything than make 50% on my money. I mean, that's the thinking here. And you talk to people on Reddit, they, <sighs> they, they would rather show their losses than just win 10%. Um, they'd rather this go to is zero wild, than man. win 10%. But is there a lesson here for someone listening who's just getting into trading? What what would obviously we're not here to give financial advice, but yeah, would you tell them to not bet the ranch basically? Well, but that's the thing is I'm a gambler and my whole life has been, you know, crazy ups and downs and being massively in debt and then being rich and then in debt and being rich. That's the way I live my life. So I completely Fair understand play too, that. Life. Fair play. I respect <laughs> the admission. Listen, when I was 26 years old, 25. 26 years old, I had $2 million in debt. I had $70,000 in credit card debt. I was, there was, IRS was chasing me. I had basically, I lived in an apartment and I, I had like one account that I could still draw money from and all the other ones, the banks had closed. I was in a lot of trouble. And I Jesus. took massive risks and got out of that hole. So I get this idea because the reality wow. is, yeah. you get yeah, the mentality. Yeah. If you're a regular guy making regular money, it's very hard to get rich, right? It doesn't happen without taking this For massive sure. risk. Some gamble. No, true. So I get it. I, th and, I think that's you right. Know, and if you look at the artistic fields, like acting, music, all of these things, I mean, you have to risk everything, right? Or it doesn't happen. Yeah, no, y'all was going to say. It's so yeah. I get it and I understand it, but you have to also be prepared to lose to everything lose. because that's also the reality and people get really lucky or they don't. Um, yeah. So yeah, I but, mean, my, my under, like my rational, you know, edu people should take, learn everything they can about a market before they invest in it. Don't be foolish with your money and understand that you can lose everything. But at the same time, if you're willing to lose everything, you know, <laughs> take a risk and go for it. That's, that's yeah. Bad this advice. Just, <laughs> right? No, it's, it's, First of all, I respect the transparency and it sounds like you ultimately know what you're doing. Um, but the I think that makes you the perfect person to write about this as well because I feel like in some parts you identify. I think that one of the challenges is that, um, I was, this is not mine, but I was told this years ago, um, that you can buy hope. But the problem is hope in isolations without a taxonomy, right? It, it, you can't measure hope. Right. But people buy hope and desperate yeah. people buy hope and that's... a uh, and it sounds to me like you, it sounds like you've gone on your own roller coaster, right? You've been there and you got out of it. How, I bet you won't return to buying hope. Well, right? you know, listen, I mean, I'll always be a gambler. Listen, the, the whole lottery ticket phenomenon, like I love scratch tickets and I know they're the stupidest thing in the world, right? But how do you not, <laughs> right. how do you not love them? I mean, how do you not love the idea that you- I think they're fun too. Right, they're yeah. so much fun. And, and it's, it's really tough because <laughs> lo the logical portion of your mind is like, this is just stupid, right? But the other part of your mind- right. is, What if? What's the whole point of everything if I can't dream that I'm going to hit the million dollar lottery, right? Right, so even right, Even as right, I became right. successful, it's very hard to shed that feeling, that, that want of like, you know, something exciting and incredible right. to happen. Yeah. I think that one money is way better than earned money. <laughs> and I really do. The money you just yeah. win out of nowhere is so much more fun than the one that you worked really hard for, which is really stupid. And it, it's against sort of everything that you're taught as a kid. But but that's a feeling that's very hard to lose. And so I kind of understand the gambling mentality. And I do also understand the idea that, listen, Wall Street is a casino. Um, it's just kind of bull at this point. The idea, my parents are, are older and they're like, does this mean the stock market doesn't work anymore? And I'm like, I don't think the stock market ever really worked. I think it was always kind of a, a big sort of joke that other people were in on that the regular people weren't in on. Wall Street firms, oh, I totally agree. Look, look at the pandemic. Wall Street firms did great. Bankers did mm. great. I mean, they, they had the best year of their lives. These people were making mm -hmm. fortunes. Well, regular people were losing their jobs and, and, and everyone's stuck at home. And it's kind of like, this, this, it shows you that the fundamentals don't mean anything anymore. GameStop can be as valuable as Apple. 
Uh, you know, mm. Dogecoin can be as valuable as anything and it's completely pointless and useless. Right. Um, and I think that that's what's happened now is we're starting to see that the, the tethers are not there anymore. And and I and I, I on the one hand, I love it. I think it's great. I think it's great that regular people who are savvy enough to jump into something because there's a social movement behind that can win. Um, but at the same time, everything's broken. And I think there there has to be some regulation. There has to be some sort of adult in the room to come in and finally say, all right, this has to be fixed. Because if this keeps going mm-hmm. on, how do you know what's worth anything? Um, you know, how do you value anything properly anymore? The minute we toss the rule book out the window to everything, this is a this is a dangerous place that we live right. in, it's, right? So yeah. if if we yeah. don't if we don't learn traditional skills, if we just think that anyone can sell any shit on social media, and we don't need financial markets, we don't need in plumbers, we don't need anything. Let's just invent everything. This will be chaos. Yeah. It's the only word I can think of, and I think it's terribly dangerous because my kids are growing up in a world where, you know, if they are not very very poor and they're okay. Um, they're in a sensitized world where they think they can do anything and they think it can become easy. They can do it easy. Maybe bet on a, a, a run on, on, on GameStop or I'll sell, some, I'll sell some advice on social media. I think ultimately the fundamentals of value will be challenged and a lot of people will be unhappy. And th- th- this idea of what is value, this is going to get its greatest examination in 100 years and it's the crypto market, yeah. mm-hmm. right? It is, is the greatest transition we're ever going to see. Although it, the if you take value in terms of sustained value, you get those moments like where Dogecoin pops up, GameStop pops up, but ultimately they have to do something after. So if GameStop don't progress, right. it's just going to hit the same thing again. Or, you know, we're, uh, even when we talked um, with Sam Bankman, Dogecoin was obviously the big chat, but he was talking about other coins that actually had tangible Right, technology behind it that model. would yeah. that would stick. Do right. you know what I mean? And right. um, so I, I do think that applies, and it does, and it in the long term, yeah. Because now they're attempting to pivot and become a, a digital. Uh, you know, listen, GameStop has this huge group of people who love it, and they're all gamers for sure. And the gaming industry yeah. is doing fantastic. So how they can harness their mm. audience if they can go exactly. digital, if they can create, you know, this virtual whatever community, they should be a successful company going forward. Um, and if they can yeah. figure that out, they will. So you're right. In the end, you would think eventually fundamentals do matter. Yeah. Um, and that, by the yeah. way, is what Melvin Capital kept, why they kept holding their short position is they believe sooner or later, True. people are going to realize this company is going to go to crap. The- but it didn't happen <laughs> in their time frame. But the thing is, is you're right. You would think that over the long term. But then again, you look at what's happening on social media and the power mm. of the mob is in itself something that you have to take into account and it doesn't go anywhere. And so the reality is, if the Reddit mob continued to believe in GameStop, it could continue to go up forever um, because they don't care about the fundamentals and their money is as big as any money that's out there. Um, so, you know, you're right. Fundamentals should at some point matter. Um, but the reality is, if a social group can can stick with an ideal, um, then a meme stop can continue to go forward. Um, can continue. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. similar with crypto. Um, you know, whichever crypto we all agree is the right one is going to be profitable. Um, gold is, is, oh, is just sure. one of many, you know, metals out there, right? We've chosen yeah, it to sure. be valuable, but it's not more rare than many others. Um, and we've just made that decision. So, you know, in the way the, 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 the fundamental value of something isn't what we agree it's worth. I mean, you can look at the art world too. Yeah. I mean, what makes one painting worth another yeah. painting? I mean, we can't talk about this story without mentioning Wall Street Bets, the big Reddit board that drove this. So what was their role in it? Yeah. And why does that particular thread have so much power? Well, so Wall Street Bets was founded as this kind of off kilter uh, stock around stocks. But one of the cool things about it was it was wins and losses. People would post not just how they made money, but they would post a picture of their ugly account where they just lost all their money. And so we created this community behind trading that wasn't and by the way they're very smart people on there you know a lot of the media portrayed it as you know trolls and incels and kind of this done group of people but if you start to sift through there there's a lot of really savvy sure. investors on that board who really yep. know their stuff um but it created this community and at, at the time it was a small community and as this grew the story grew it grew and so now it's at 10 million ah, people. Got you. so it's very very big now um but yeah it was it's a community based around sort of um, a dark 
kind of language. You know, they call themselves apes and the retards is the word they use. Oh, wow. And, and, and if you go on there, really there's much. a lot of, this is of deep. yeah, there's a lot of, so when Melvin Capital was outed as shorting it, someone put up this video of comparing them to Chernobyl and bursting up in flames. And so they were, yeah, 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 but yeah. in my opinion, a lot of that is a smoke screen to keep regular people out and to keep the community connected. Once you get through that language and get through sort of the stuff that might be disagreeable to my parents' generation, um, you right. find a very vibrant community of people who are, who are actually very smart and savvy. And so um, when, you know, Keith Gill was posting about, you know, GameStop, people were trashing him, saying this is stupid. But when certain things started to happen and people saw the short squeeze in action, everybody who was smart moved yeah. in and started to put the reasons why this was going to work. And, and so it became very, very intellectual. Are most of these communities, and we've talked a bit about all of them, but I just wanted to bring it together. The people you met whilst interviewing for these books in these communities, were they people who wanted to stick it to the suits? Did they want to make money or are they just bored and said, F it? Yeah. I mean, listen, I think there's a lot of nihilistic bored F it guys. That definitely exists. I mean, there's definitely this, and especially because of the pandemic. And I think this could have only happened now. I think there's this, feeling that, you know, the reality is screwed up. We're in the wrong simulation. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna yeah. get home and everything doesn't look right. So I'm angry. But definitely screw Wall Street or take it to the man for once we're going to win. That was a big theme here. Um, and then there mm -hmm. were people like, you know, college kids and people like that who were like, this is gambling. I'm going to make some quick money because, you know, this is happening once. And once a short street starts, you know, the, the sky is the limit on how much money I can make on this move. So there's there's all three of those, but I do think the most the most relevant one to me and the one I think I saw the most of was we're going to screw Wall Street. Um, mm -hmm. and that's why I tie it back to Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street was a, a small phenomenon in, in the in the general. Yeah. There's a bunch of people in a park, yeah. right? That was never going to take off because the reality is none of us want to go sit in a park uh, in a tent and yell at J.P. Morgan. I mean, that just doesn't get mm -hmm. us anywhere. But if you can do the same thing from your home with two hundred dollars and maybe make money on it, I think we all agree with that. And so I think there was there was that sort of undercurrent of we're going to take it to the man for and we're going to beat Wall Street at their own game. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that anger kind of pushed it forward. Um, I, I, yeah. I also think there's this thing of um, collective reasoning and it's deadly in mob culture. Right. So, uh, it, uh, you know, a great a great example here is who the hell thought that f***ing Reddit would still be around. <laughs> right. True. But, but, but Reddit has got some loyal people, yeah. right? It's like Tumblr and all these things that when, you know, when we were breaking into the internet of things, right, web 1.0, and it's still here. And yet once someone puts something out there, if it resonates, my God, it's infectious. Yeah. Yeah, man. So I wonder if it's just they're part of a community. And you mentioned three areas, but the fourth being that you, they evolved their thinking, like, like some amorphous uh, organism, right? They're like, oh, everyone's doing this. I got to, this seems right. Because I'm a loyal Reddit follower and, and, and this seems wrong. Yeah. Right. And so how do I get involved? Oh, I'm also desperate. So I'm going to do something. <laughs> because this is what happened, right? Yeah. It, otherwise, how does it ignite on one platform? Yeah. I mean, it's great. Listen, part of it is sincerity. You know, you can't game these things. And, and people have tried many, many times. But creating yeah. something to go viral on Reddit is almost impossible. But yep. zero, like a, a guy in his basement who sincerely believes that GameStop's going to be worth $1,000 a share. That works, you know, because people, you know, the, the stupidity, whatever it is, it really connects with a lot of people. So you're right. It's yeah. a community that grew organically yeah. mm. um, and, and GameStop yeah. did grow organically. You know, um, you, you couldn't have sat back a year ago and, and guessed that this would happen. Um, uh, but, you know, as it was happening, as you analyze it, you're like, well, it makes sense now. This community was looking for something to rally behind. And it was mm. this kind of schmo in the middle of nowhere they were able to rally behind. So, yeah. Do you think these communities, you know, and you just mentioned Martin, who would have thought it'd still be around and right. these things catch fire, these ideas. And the thing that I find, I guess, a bit worrying and when you talk about value and all this stuff is that often this these ideas catch fire with secondhand information right. or perhaps uh, skill sets that aren't fully formed. Do you know what I mean? People that are like kind of having fun or gambling, but then they become gospel. Do you know what I mean? And that's kind of dangerous, man. Like you see uh, like webs detectives, you know, that grab police reports from online and all that. And then they can ruin someone's life by falsely accusing someone online. Right. And then the whole 
life is done, right? Like that girl in the disappearing girl in the LA hotel. Yeah. Uh, was, and so in this one, you've got all these people that trade every day for a living. That's what, you know, they working with key information, highly skilled, big tools. And then you've got these people that just an, an, an idea takes form and then they're changing the landscape and we're having books written about it and stuff. And I just, I wonder if it's positive, man. <laughs> it's a big question. Do you know what I mean? But in your yeah. opinion, is like- it positive what's going to happen? Like, yeah, it's really interesting. I think in the in general, it's probably not positive for society. <laughs> I think it, individually, I, I think it can be very positive if you're if you're smart and careful and you figure out you know how to properly ride these waves of social media. What's interesting now is all these hedge funds are now hiring teams of people to sit on these boards and scour them for what they might be going what direction. So, in the reality, is that hedge funds will try to incorporate this into their research. Um, no, oh, for sure. No yeah. one's gonna, They're already doing it. Yeah, no fair enough. Do a public short position again on a company like GameStop. I mean, nobody will make that mistake again. Um, so, yeah, no. people learn and the system learns from it. Um, I do think there's value in, in a community like Reddit is, is, you know, having spent a lot of time on it now to write this book. I see the value in it. And people really find a community and a family in, in a world that is becoming like it is right now you need to go right. somewhere and i think to that extent right um that's why these things survive and grow and and, and are and that's a good what? thing but you're right there's a lot of danger here and and the fact that you don't know who people are reddit is is significant mm. in that could be anyone very yeah. anonymous unlike facebook mm. and mm. even twitter right. to some extent there's some control at twitter twitter's twitter's pretty bad too but reddit is purely anonymous right you they want you to be anonymous. oh yeah do you ask the question about the platforms, Jax, right, in, in terms of like, should they be around? How have they lasted so long? People want a sense of belonging. I mean, right? yeah, that's and, what you're and, saying. And so, you know, Reddit finds its audience because there's a level of unfettered transparency, mm. right? We, in, a, in, the, in the digital world, we've crowned people kings and queens. Everyone can have a view. Now, whether you want that much transparency or not, that is pretty much the world we live in. That's what, you know, the internet's created. There's a challenge here. There's a massive problem, and that's that whilst we've crowned, crowned king and queens, the person that's likely to figure out what's you know, broken or working is the aggregation of all those data points. So whether it's on Reddit or on Twitter or in the financial markets, we've, we've, we're dealing now with a level of transparency, a level of data, and we're just nodes in this. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of a non-applicable AI. Mm -hmm. Right, which learns. This one doesn't learn. It's just that our behavior just starts to happen. And and whether we like it or not, we, we've got to come to terms with this level of, of data transparency. Mm. So no one really saw, in the example of this guy in Brockton, Massachusetts, no one really saw it. I mean, the fact that it was so authentic and people resonated with it. Mm. No one saw the level or the scale of it, right? Or what would ensue afterwards. That's because we've got all this transparency now. And I... I'll be honest, Ben, and maybe I'm approaching 50, or maybe I should feel a, a little happier, a bit more optimistic, because I'm generally a half glass full guy, as I like to say. But I think there's pause for thought. Like, we've got a long way to navigate this digital world, right, in terms of regulation, in terms of the correct skill sets, in terms of consumer protection, in sure, terms of yeah, protecting yeah. people. There's a lot of stuff that's got to go through. And I kind of feel like we're just getting into the main you know, rounds of, of a match. Mm. A boxing match like we're not through it right mm -hmm. it, it, it's just exploded and one example of it is this game stop mm -hmm. absolutely i think you're totally right i mean we're 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 in uncharted territories and it's grown organically and so fast that there's nobody uh, no authority figure who can say and step in and say okay this needs to be fixed this is. i mean you look at what happened with facebook and it starts as this happy village i mean the idea behind it was we're going to create a village where we're all going to be friends and circles of friends and things like that. And, and that was sort of Zuckerberg's vision. Um, and the reality became something much more monstrous as it grew, right? And, and to the point where it's affecting elections and it's, it's you know, data being sold and all of this kind of stuff. Going no on, yeah. You yeah. Know? And you're like, okay, this is a monster now. And how do we rein it in? And then how do you rein something yeah. in that's that powerful? Um, and yeah. and it's, it's, it's similar. Reddit, you know, is less menacing, I think, than Facebook because it is a free for all. But the crowd becomes the dangerous thing because the crowd is unmanageable. Um, the only thing to yeah. do is turn the switch off, right? And so that's that. You know, you're right. I mean, how do you manage this? And that's something I think it'll take a long time and a, and a lot of 
tragedies. <laughs> the other area that scares me, and the pandemic is a prime example of it, is that the problem with conspiracy theories is they're based in some form of truth. Right. The word, the operative word, is some form, mm -hmm. right? And so. If you've got kings and queens, always it means a guy in his basement probably got his knackers out, right, sitting there writing about the vaccines, all of a sudden looks like he's some expert. Right. And then all of a sudden he, he puts out some kind of conspiracy. Mm. This multiplies like a cancer. Mm. And so no wonder we've got all these conspiracies. And you know what? Then you've got the president or the former president saying fake news. Mm. Now all of a sudden we're back to my point of let's toss the rule book out the window and it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, now we're listening to all of these unfettered opinions. Yeah. I mean, listen, conspiracies are more fun. And, and uh, my bread and butter is writing <laughs> about things like this. And the reality is we are – born innately to search for these things. We love, our brains are wired to look for conspiracies and to find patterns where they don't exist because that's how we survive yeah. to the point where we're at. So someone in his basement, you know, with no actual knowledge, if he puts it in the right words, is way more exciting and interesting to our brains than a guy in a white lab coat who actually studied his whole life. Um, yeah, you know, man. It's, it's all, and then Reddit puts it all on the same playing field, and they one bubbles up and another one bubbles up. It's, it's a weird world we live in, I agree, and it's going to be very, very hard to navigate going forward. Um, but, um, but in the end, you know, it's also exciting, and, and, uh, and there's so many great like GameStop is a perfect example of where there's a lot of positives too. There's a lot of people who who did very well and it it gave a big finger to Wall Street, which is, you know, something that couldn't have happened without Reddit and without these social media. And at the same time there's people who lost money and got screwed in the end. So, you know, yeah. you gotta take the good with the bad, I think. Yeah. Fair point. Check this out, bro. So the guy who actually started Wall Street Bits, yeah. Rogozinski, got banned for monet trying to attempting to monetize the thread. Right. And obviously like Reddit users hate this. You know, they're as we've discussed, big community with a capital C. And you're talking about the nurse who was supporting Trump. Uh she's called Kim. Uh, she was following Trump threads and stumbled upon Wall Street bets and apparently how her parents lost their house in two thousand and eight and the life and finances were all pretty hard. Yeah. Like you know, what brings someone to make these kind of high risk moves? And can you tell us yeah, like a story character. of one of the characters yeah, you write absolutely. about in this book? And so, uh, you know, there's there's the A story of this book, which is the stuff you've read in the news, which is this guy in Brockton and this giant hedge fund and Robin Hood and Elon Musk. That's one part of the story which I tell. And the other part of the story is I found these regular people on Reddit. And Kim, you know, she's a, a single mother of two. She's a nurse. She's been divorced twice. She, her lot in life hasn't been great. And she's you really was into Trump because the reality is government has screwed her all along and it didn't really matter which president it was. It was always screwing her. She voted for Obama and it didn't make her life any better. So she voted for Trump and it didn't make her life any better either. Um, so basically, you know, she's she's actually a wonderful person. If you met her, you would love her. And 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 she's a registered nurse, you know, takes care of patients in a psychiatric hospital and see it seen the worst of the pandemic because a lot of people. Yeah. Well, we're in a mess situation and there was a lot of COVID and, you know, it, it was a disaster where she was working in California. Um, and and basically she was on this Reddit board for Donald Trump lovers, you know, the R the Donald, uh, which I believe got <laughs> shut down. I'm not sure. But she was on this and started seeing people posting about Wall Street bets. So she went over there and she saw this all happening and she didn't have very much money. I think she had five thousand dollars that she opened the Robin Hood account and she Put it in GameStop um, because mm, it looked mm. like she were gonna they were gonna beat Wall Street. She was she had a lot of anger and stuff like that, and she wrote it up, you know, a lot. So when she had bought in, she ended up uh, getting to a point where she could have gotten out with I think fifty thousand dollars, but she yeah um, she she basically you know then started to get the stars in the eyes like oh now I'm I could make five hundred thousand dollars I can't do yeah. that now um, so the community becomes a double edged sword. Like on the one hand, on the way up, the community bolsters you. But then when you want to get out, the community doesn't let you out. Um, because if you look no. at Wall Street Bets, if you post, I want to sell, you're destroyed on the board. But can't they just sell? Why do they have because to tell have everyone? have diamond hands. The idea is if you don't have diamond hands and you don't hold on, if we don't all hold on together, we're all going to lose. Oh, and my God. The problem is and it gets very powerful. It's a powerful form of peer pressure because – at that point, you don't want to be the crack in the armor. And and, and it doesn't make no. sense. If everyone sells, the stock does go down. If everyone holds, the stock goes up. And so the feeling is if any one of you breaks you know, rank, we're all going to lose. And so it's very hard to sell um, when you're in a community-based investing situation. But you're saying emotionally it's hard to sell, but not 
actually so basically you practically hard to sell. You can go and sell, yeah. But oh you my still, god, you guys! You still got to find sellers, though, right? Yeah, but I mean, there are loads of people because they were driving it up. Oh yeah, anyway, you could yeah. sell it in an instant, yeah. but she didn't want to sell um, because she was part of the whole community. Oh, so how much did she end up with? Well, you know, the story's not over yet. She still holds her shares. She <gasps> ran it up, oh my day! Uh, so she ran it all the way up. Damn. Okay. Um. No, no financial advice, but get out. <laughs> still up a little bit. Um. And she did take a little bit out. So um. Oh. So she ended up not losing a ton of money, but you know. <clears throat> every penny counts to her. So, yeah. you know, you, you want to see them get out at the very top, but nobody gets out at the top. You know, the only people, Kim. although in the book, I do get to this hedge fund. This is a great story. And it's kind of the end of the book, but um, this giant hedge fund made $700 million. Um, what? On the positive side, they basically rode it up with the GameStop, re- the, the rabble. Um, so right, they're the ones right, who made the right. real money in the end is these hedge yeah. funds that saw what was happening. Um, and so, yo, I'm gonna invest in that hedge but, fund. What's the name of that one? Uh, they uh, seem smart. Send bet. Yeah, they they, they <laughs> send bet. I'm doing that, and they're really funny. They're named after those little security thing tags that are on clothing. Amazing. And so they did, they didn't even have that much money, and they put it all into GameStop, and they wrote it up, and then got out right when Elon Musk tweeted. Generally, when Elon Musk tweeted. Right. <laughs> You sell, you, sell this you get stuff. out, right? right. Yeah, because no, it's just, wild. Let yeah. I me mean, think about it. He's representing a view, a sentiment. I know, right? <laughs> think about this. There's a there's a theme that Ben's kind of couching through this, right? Oh. And that's that. It's called it's called anger. Yeah. Sure. Right. Anger is yeah. a theme through. And, and by like the way, Shakespeare. When do you make your best decisions when you're angry? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. True. And, and and the other sentiment is one that just doesn't care. You may not be angry. And, and I think of Elon Musk when he does things. It's like, oh my god, let me just say this. Right. It's almost like a personal experiment to see what happens. Yeah. It's like chaos theory. Yeah. Uh, I just I find it really dangerous. I find it really dangerous. Oh yeah, I mean mm. it's, um, it's fun. I do a really fun run into Elon Musk. When you get to that chapter, you it's very. What do you say about I him? I have him running around under the streets of L.A. with a flamethrower fighting giant AI robots while he decides what to do about GameStop. <laughs> because my feeling about Elon Musk is we all kind of know That's who good. he is, but let's really go into who he really is. And I think these these Marvel character. He's not a normal person and he doesn't live a normal life and he's not tethered to reality like no. the rest of us. And you're right. He doesn't it, deep down, doesn't really give a crap, but he's full of anger and he's probably not, he's probably stoned to be honest, most of the time. And he's living life the way I think many of us would, if we were a genius multi-billionaire with spaceships and <laughs> giant flamethrowers and, and, and AI. And, and that's, that's the story of Elon Musk that I wanted to tell. So I, I really think that <laughs> you're right. That moment was absurd and it put, it, but it was also affected the market in a massive way. And that's the interesting yeah. thing about Elon Musk is he can affect the stock market um, oh, yeah. with his random tweets. And so, you know, yeah. that's crazy. Are, yeah. Are you a fan of Elon Musk then? I, I am a big fan. Yeah, I am. Absolutely. I don't want to over influence you here, Ben, and you just got to meet me. And yeah. I just want to let you know that that, that I'm I'm Britain's Elon Musk, and, and <laughs> Is that right? I have a lot in common. No, you've been uh, named apparently. Britain. All right, I've been yeah. named Britain's I Elon love Musk. It. So, so uh, I, I, I don't now. have a billion dollars, but I got everything else, and I'm not going to space, but I got aircraft, and um, and I got multiple ventures. So if you want to write a book about, oh, me, you're, do let you? me know. you're gonna, oh, awesome! You got to read my Elon Musk chapter because maybe I'm. Not I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. He should have already done it. I, see, I love, I, mean, I love prep. it. Like when I watch, you know, Marvel, and you see Iron Man, and and when when he's like doing his thing, like uh, apart from the suit, the lifestyle, that's what I want to be. If I could be that, he's person. got a face like a like a Marvel character. If I'm being honest with you, that chin. That's serious, bro. <laughs> really? That's a serious chin. Yeah. Quick fire questions for anyone listening now who think they want to get into this thing. You know, they might just be interested in what happened or they're just like, do you know what? I can make a bit of money too. Yeah. Is there anything wrong with that? No, listen, I in think that if you are careful and you go on Reddit boards, Wall Street bets, and, and you start looking at what people are, are looking into, uh, you can make money uh, uh, day trading those stocks. It's dangerous as heck. I wouldn't advise it if it's the money mm-hmm. you need to eat with. But playing around in that, playing around in crypto, listen, I, I think there are people making fortunes with little amounts of money. So I don't think it's stupid to look at it, that. Everything in moderation. Sure. Right? I mean, that's really the moral sure. of the story. Well, right? I mean, yeah. You don't want to use and then, you need to eat. But at the same time, taking a bet here and there, you know, it's not a bad idea. Don't bet the baby's diapers. Okay, coming from a serial bet. Right? True, you know, like, true, You want to, you want to make an occasional bet. It's fine. Do, do you feel the people that won out of this, how do they feel now? And do you reckon this might happen again? Will there be a big pump and dump on the scale of AMC, GameStop, 
And are these people looking for it? Yes, we will see this again and again. I really, truly believe that. I think that the markets have come unhinged from the fundamentals. I think the power of social media is underestimated by Wall Street still. And I do think you'll see an AMC again. You'll see a GameStop again, again and again and again. Do you think that this book will be made into a movie? You've had one made before. And are you minted because of the movie being made? Yeah, no, he's had two books. He's had two. What, movie. two? So you must be double minted. So surely you're not gambling anymore. I did stop. You know, I used to do these speeches. You'd go to Vegas and speak in front of some bank and they'd pay you. And then I'd gamble whatever they paid me. And then I would leave with nothing. And then I stopped doing that. <laughs> Please tell us, tell us a story of a big loss and a big win. Oh, man. Please. I, I, I once went to Vegas and I... A big win. I've won probably one hundred and twenty thousand dollars playing blackjack at one sitting. That's like the biggest win. The boy. biggest loss, though, I've definitely lost fifty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. And you miss your flight back, yeah. you know, because it's like you're still gambling. <laughs> it's all night long. It's the next morning. It's light, and you miss the flight back, and you're sitting there, oh god. And you know, you were paid like twenty thousand dollars to speak at the event. So you're like, why did I even come to Vegas? It's the worst. Mm-hmm. So. I stopped doing that, but, um, and I stopped doing online gambling and, you know, I have kids now. I don't, I don't gamble, but I have that feeling like I love the idea behind it. Um, so I try to avoid it now. Um, you know, gambling is like the worst of addictions because if you're into drugs and you go into rehab and you come out, you get your life back to some degree, but if you lose all of your money and you come out, you don't get your money back. Um, you can't, there's no recovery from losing all of your money, right? So I do think gambling is a horrible addiction. But anyways, this is going to be a movie. Um, MGM, uh, Mike DeLuca, who did The Social Network, is the head of MGM, and they bought it. The screenplay is in. And it's Congratulations. It's directors and writers right now. It's going to be, it's their green, it's a greenlit, very quick movie. So it's actually happening now. So we'll probably be uh, shooting it shortly. Um, ah, congratulations. So do you get paid a lot for that? Um, you get paid a lot. I mean, that's what I mean, like every movie is different. Um, you know, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But this sort of project, you do get paid a lot. Yeah. Well, listen, Ben, thank you so much <laughs> yeah. for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Highly, highly informative and fun. You guys are thank great. you, man. Thank you. And congrats. I really appreciate it. It's- thank you. 